FM, and to those tuned in via our YouTube channel, Paul View. We welcome all to this media briefing that is being put on by the Joint Select Committee on National Security. This briefing follows the committee's visit to the Port of Port of Spain, which took place on Friday, July 14th, uh, 2017, in which we invited members of the media to tour the facilities at the Port of Port of Spain with us. At this time, I would introduce the members of the, of the Joint Select Committee on National Security who are gathered here with us. We'll start with the chairman of the committee, Mr. Fitzgerald Hines. To the chairman's left is the vice chairman of the committee, Mr. Prakash Ramada. To Mr. Ramada's left is committee member Nicole Oliver. To Ms. Oliver's left is committee member Wayne Sturge. To Mr. Sturge, Mr. Sturge's left is committee member W. Michael Coppin. We come back to the chairman's right. We have Mr. Nigel De Freitas. And to Mr. De Freitas's right is committee member Paul Richards. At this time, we hand over to the chairman of the National Security, to the Joint Select Committee of National Security's chairman, Fitzgerald Hines, to update the public and the media on the committee's findings. Thank you very much. So, Mike. In its continuing efforts to address the epidemic of the prevalence of guns on the streets, and in the hands of persons not so authorized across Trinidad and Tobago, and in keeping with this Joint Select Committee's mandate to examine issues relevant to the security, safety, and protection of citizens, the working relationships between various agencies involved in intelligence gathering, how they collect, coordinate, analyze, disseminate information, and how these functions might be enhanced, and the mechanisms to review the performance and activities of the various agencies involved in national security and critical infrastructure. This committee visited the port of Port of Spain on Friday, the 14th of July, 2017. The Joint Select Committee conducted this site visit as a follow-up to its inquiry into the prevalence of firearms on the streets of Trinidad and Tobago. Ladies and gentlemen, we brought all of the elements of national security, the Port Authority of Port of Spain, the Customs Division of the Ministry of Finance, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Prison Service. We brought all the major stakeholders together and we made a bit of an inquiry into their activities as it relates to illegal guns on the streets. We made the point that the citizenry of Trinidad and Tobago, and in some cases our visitors, are suffering, and significantly so, at the hands of illegal users of firearms, and the large number of murders or crimes taking place are really carried out with the use of illegal firearms. This prompted, interestingly enough, an editorial on Wednesday, the 5th of July, 2017, from the Daily Express, under the rubric, Who's Minding the Gun Store? And I simply want to just quote a few elements of it, if you would permit me. This editorial observed that the takeaway from that meeting of all the stakeholders that I just described left the citizenry with a few on a basic learnings. One, trafficking in guns to and from this country is 100 million dollar a year trade. 40% of containers entering the country are not checked. There are slack and corrupt officers across the public sector platform who aid and abet the illegal gun trade. Yachties are among those who might very well be involved in this trade. There's no re legislation restricting the use of small engine vessels, and the number of illegal firearms in this country would send shivers through citizens, unquote. Well, to paraphrase them. 
And I quote again, in conclusion, the editorial says, again and again, revelations at the National Security Joint Select Committee tell stories of slackness and neglect, whether in relation to illegal gun importations, DNA logistics, unhurried paperwork, in expert investigations and prosecutions or political grandstanding. Again and again, citizens absorb the savagery of unchecked criminal activities and are told all the ways their governments are working for them while they vote in hope and live in disappointment. Criminality runs deep, far, and wide. A valent, strategic offensive by those who are charged with the responsibility to do so has been late in coming. How much more, how much longer could we wait? Those words, to my mind, demonstrate very appositely and powerfully the need for the inquiries upon which this Joint Select Committee is predicated. So, having gone down to the port, we found a number of issues which my colleagues on this Joint Select Committee will in turn address. But the most glaring of all, in my view, is the fact that since 2005, discussions began among the relevant stakeholders for the implementation of modern technology in the form of scanners to scan containers and barrels and vehicles entering and leaving the port of Port of Spain and the port of Point Lisas and that. In 2014, this scanning system was actually commissioned, but to date, it is still not being used for reasons, as some indicated, health and safety concerns. There are a number of these scanners can, of course, examine as steel, or it can get visibility through steel, and it can get clear visibility into containers where it might be otherwise difficult to unstuff and to personally check. These scanners are used in Jamaica, in Barbados, and in many other modern ports around the world. The fact that we have them here, the technology is in place, and the unions representing the workers who are expected to operate them include the Seamen and Waterfront Workers Trade Union, the Haulers Association, the Estate Police Association, and the PSA. I am happy to inform you that all but one of those unions have actually signed off on the MOU to deal with the health and safety concerns that were previously expressed. I can tell you that a radiation expert and a nuclear physicist have all indicated that there are no issues in relation to using it. And this matter will be elaborated upon in the next few moments by some of our colleagues. There's one fixed scanner system there already in place. We had the opportunity to see it. It is separate and apart from the operational room where the personnel operating it, through the use of computers, would be seated and yet it continues to remain unoperational. In fact, in addition to that fixed scanner, we procured four other mobile or hand scanners, as some people call them. Two have been dispatched to the Point Lisa port, and two are in Port of Spain, and yet for all, the citizens of this country are not now enjoying the benefits of the safety and security that its implementation could easily bring. And when one considers the number of containers that comes through these ports 
and the importance of security because this committee's concern is largely about illegal firearms and illicit activity impacting on national security. We are deeply concerned and we are here today to indicate that among other things. And therefore, I would like in this regard to make the floor open to Senator Richards, who will take it from here in relation to his particular observations at the port last time you went there. Last. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Thank you to the members of the media and those gathered here today. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate our Chairman, who, uh, as you can see, has been able to rally his troops even though Parliament is on recess because of the importance we place on restoring safety and security to Trinidad and Tobago as the uh, Joint Select Committee on National Security because of the, the amount of work that needs to be done in terms of restoring security and safety in Trinidad and Tobago because, quite frankly, the criminals are not taking a recess, so neither will we. Uh, and le let me start by saying that, you know, and thanking the leadership of the Port Authority for cooperation and facilita facilitating us last Friday. And our commentary is not in any way meant to bash the workers and the management of the port, but to raise concerns that we have uh, been able to see through our tour last Friday. Uh, and, and at this time, commend the excellent and dedicated work of personal reports at all levels. Uh, but from the start, I'd like to say, based on walking through and listening to the management, in my opinion, there's too much dependence on persons and key persons, although they're qualified and experienced to do so, and not systems and technology. I'll start with the issue of the percentage of containers that are searched or not searched in spite of a system uh, designed to flag containers leaving more than 40% not searched at a good time. This is of grave concern given the volume of illegal firearms seemingly entering the country, and it's unlikely to me that given the volume flagged by the SSA, uh, and I'm quoting from the, the Newspaper Express uh, 5th of July article where, and I quote, the population was left with the following trafficking in guns to and from its country is 100 million a year trade. One can only surmise that w with that volume or that quantum of, of value of illegal guns, some are passing through the, the legal ports in Trinidad and Tobago. And, when you think of the fact that, as the chairman indicated, there are countries, including Jamaica and Barbados and others, that have implemented technology and full-scale scanners at their main ports, and they are citing uh, identifying illegal guns. It is unlikely that we who have not implemented scanners and technology at that level can say that we have found no illegal guns or that level of contraband coming into our main ports. So that's of concern to me. Uh, also. There's too much access to me, from what I've seen, and not enough redundancy security arrangements for persons moving from one area to another once one gains possibly legitimate access to the port because of the vast area uh, stretching from the Caracom jetty at the lighthouse area all the way down to Movie Town where we see the cars stored. That is of concern, uh, and there's great possibility for security and contraband smuggling breach possibilities. The storage area for vehicles, as the, as the chairman said, and the documentation protocols, which from what we saw, simply entails two employees taking notes on a clipboard with no digital documentation in 2017. The port has been in existence since the 1930s, and it's hard to imagine that more technology has not been employed. There is, and I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but when you have persons writing on clipboards, that opens the door for possible breaches in security and malfeasance, and that's of concern. There should be network computers, iPads. There are no cameras in that area. And given the, the value of the commodity, the other vehicles, I'm surprised that there were no cameras, one, for the safety and security of the vehicles, and two, as a secondary documentation for vehicles entering that area and leaving. That's astounding to me. The basic search of the vehicles is also of great concern, which, when we were there, it took about seven minutes. Uh, there were two, and I understand there are sometimes three people searching, and there was no search under the vehicle or in the wheelbase. They searched inside of the cars, but when questions were asked of the person, well, why didn't they search under the vehicles? We were told, well, if there's information or intelligence flagging a particular vehicle, then a more extensive search is carried out. I would imagine that a basic look under the vehicle does not need extra flagging. 
That should be basic protocol, and that's of great concern to me. Uh, we also were told that, well, the, the chairman asked, well, are all the vehicles locked? Uh, yes, but some of the keys are not working. So if the, if the vehicles are left open in an un uh, so monitored area through CCTV cameras, one can only imagine that persons may gain access to and retrieve possible contraband. I would imagine CCTV cameras would be a priority in those areas. It, it did not exist from what I saw. The opening e and seemingly easy access of the CARICOM jetty, making an easy track for CARICOM contraband to me is amazing. Uh, given the, f the, the alleged flow of illegal guns and other contraband up the island chain and the Caribbean Lesser and, and, and Greater Antilles as a transshipment point as we've heard in international documentation over and over. That needs to be addressed. Uh, the lack of the implementation, the, the chairman spoke in detail about the, the scanner, main container scanner, which is there since 2014. And it is unfortunate that there needs, this needs to be fast tracked to facilitate a 100% scanning of containers because we can move from 60% if one believes that 60% because I'm doubtful about that to 100% scanning because of the, the issue of criminality facing Trinidad Tobago illegal guns and other contraband entering the, the country and, and Trinidad Tobago has been flagged as a significant transshipment point. And in conclusion at this stage, while I commend the port management and, and staff for their dedication and hard work, I really was not left with the level of confidence in terms of security system and redundancies uh, in operation at a, at a facility of this magnitude. This is the port of Port of Spain. And I would have imagined that we, have, we would have implemented much more technology as redundancy and safety protocols. When you, when you do a, a, a bit of research on ports operating around the world, because of the contribution of ports to any economy's mainstay in terms of revenue generation and security, technology, uh, digital, tagging of containers and all items entering and leaving so that one will know where an item is at any point from the time it, uh, it's taken off the ships or, or transport vessels to moving through the port to keeping track of it all the way through and also there's a financial uh, reconciliation that goes with that that I don't, yes I know there's the Asicuda system but I don't see uh, as they say in, in, in the judicial system uh, uh, a chain of custody of all uh, items as, as much as I would li have liked to see and or personal entering and leaving the port and those are of grave concerns to me. Thank you and good afternoon. I would like to expand a bit on some of the points raised by Member Richards. A grave area of concern for the committee was really the limited coverage of CCTV cameras throughout the entire port area. As Member Richard was just speaking about the spectrum area where the vehicles are stored, there's very, very limited cameras and that opens the room for any sort of activity to take place. Persons can enter the vehicles because as the vehicles enter the port from the vessels, they are not searched, they only search upon departing the port. So any type of interaction can take place between any person who has access to that area prior to the vehicles leaving the port and being searched. So that was a significantly a great area of concern to us. And throughout the port, the limited CCTV coverage really is worrisome. At the container terminal shed four, there's a limited coverage by CCTV cameras. And given the wide access along the coastline, Vessels can come alongside and persons can gain access without anyone being aware of such access taking place. Within the container examination section as well, I mean, there were limited cameras. The few cameras present were monitored off-site by agents of the Ministry of Finance. But again, that limited monitoring could leave room open for any sort of illegal activity taking place. Within the container scanning hall, there are absolutely no CCTV cameras whatsoever. So there's no independent record of what takes place in there. And at, at the Caricom wharves as well, there's an absence of CCTV cameras. So someone can come off a vessel at the Caricom wharves and gain access anywhere along the quayside and enter vehicles, enter containers, put things in, take things out without any record of the activity. So that certainly is a level of concern. And another area that we noted was in the efficacy of the searches particularly with the vehicles. When an agent of the port, I mean, 
does their search. It's a cursory search of the vehicle. They open it, they look inside, they just look at the trunk, the visible areas. But with the absence of advanced and detection techniques, like detection dogs are very seldom used. And it is well known that the dogs with their sensitive noses, these canines are trained to detect narcotics, they're trained to detect explosives. So they would, so the use, increased use of canines would enhance the, the searchability then of the customs area, would enhance the detection rate. So the limited use of these enhancement techniques really leads us to question how effective our searching methods and are particularly given that only 60% of the containers are reputed to be searched. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, good members of the media and members of the public um, that have been watching. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the effect of what we as a Joint Select Committee on National Security have discovered in relation to Tobago as well as specifically the CARICOM wharves here in Trinidad. Uh, what the committee has discovered in relation to the CARICOM wharves is that we noted as my other members have indicated the absence of CCTV cameras as well as um, also being informed that the successes for finding contraband have been at this location, and that many small vessels enter and leave the location unmonitored. But more importantly, the security of this location in relation to the fencing is only an eight feet high fence that surrounds this location. And therefore, you can reason that it's really, really not a secure site. Add these things up in relation to the CCTV cameras, the absence of, and this lack of security by way of fencing, and you can tell what is happening specifically at this CARICOM wharf. At the site visit uh, last Friday, I did ask the question that if everything else was done right in relation to the international port, but this CARICOM wharf was left untouched, then you would have a gaping hole in the security net of Trinidad and Tobago in terms of importation of, of uh, guns and drugs and firearms. Because what is happening is that anybody can land these contraband in any of the CARICOM nations and then come through that CARICOM wharf where there's much less security and therefore having patrols around the islands or having um, a much better security in terms of the international port would not work in that regard. Now, the problem with this in relation to Tobago is that in terms of containerized vessels that bring in goods, they would be first searched here in Trinidad and then move on to Tobago. And I have to say this because you've been hearing recently in the media in regard to the 60-40%. And that does not work unless you have numbers to really go with that. And one of the things that we found out at the site visit was that there are approximately in the Port of Spain port, 285,000 containers that come through that port on a yearly basis. Now, when you apply the percentage to that, you get 114,000 containers that are not searched. And I would let that sink in for a bit. Because the effect on that for Tobago, being a tourism destination, you can understand that Tobago is much, much harder for us to recover from that tourism standpoint. If it is you have a $100 million gun trade in Trinidad and Tobago, and if that ends up in Tobago, and you start to see crimes, especially gun crimes increasing in Tobago, then you would see the effect that we would have in Tobago in regards to tourism. Um, that being said, and the 114,000 containers that are not searched, you see where the security really needs to be beefed up in the port. Now, you've heard the chairman speak about the fixed uh, scanners that they have in the port of Port of Spain. What we would have discovered on Friday is that with the oper operationalization of this fixed scanner, the search time or the scanning time for containers comes down to five minutes. And with that five minutes, you can potentially scan 100% of containers coming through that port. So you see whereby, as Senator Richard would have indicated, is not so much a lack of resources, but a lack of use of resources that we have available to us. And I think that is one of the things that we need to look at in relation to national security and the effect that we would have on crime if it is that we are to reduce that $100 million trade. Thank you. Um, members of the media, permit me to open by referring to part of the presentation given by the Strategic Services Agency um, when last we met. Just a short um, portion. It says, um, some strategic considerations after assessing the data, again, enhancing border security is very important because a large number of illegal firearms come in through the legal ports. Let me um, repeat that. 
a large number of illegal firearms come in through the legal ports. And of course, the SSA um, being the agency tasked with gathering um, intelligence for national security purposes and um, providing this intelligence to the various security um, agencies. They have stated um, what we've long known, and I'm sure Mr. Um, Ramada can add, what we have gleaned from our um, time spent in the um, criminal justice system that most of the illegal firearms that enter this country, contrary to um, what was said in the past, they do not come in through small craft and, and pirogues and so on, but they come through the legal ports. Um, without um, trying to prejudice any any um, case that is before the courts, I'm sure you all remember a discovery in Valsin with a container of firearms, and it would be, well have been over 100 firearms. So it shows that all you need is two or three containers of firearms coming through the ports of this country unchecked, and we'll continue um, our downward spiral. So um, it is clear why, um, through our chairman, we've um, decided to proceed, and uh, we've, we've um, gained a lot of perspective from um, this exercise on Friday. Now, reference has already been made to the value of the gun trade in, in this country, and it is quite clear that given the value of the firearms trade in this country, then persons who have that sort of um, money to be engaged in such a trade would not be small players. So that we are very concerned about the 40% of containers that go unchecked. Um, in fact, some containers are allowed to leave the, the, the ports without any sort of check and proceed straight to the premises of these captains of industry. And uh, what we glean is um, there's a team dispatched thereafter to search if that ever takes place at all. Um, given what we know of Trinidad and Tobago, it is quite, quite clear that if you do not wish your um, containers to be searched, it would come at, at, at a price, which is um, very disturbing given, given what um, that may mean to the rest of us who are at the um, business end of, of a gun when it makes the, its way onto the streets. Um, so that I am um, very um, concerned about two things. One, the criteria used to identify which containers are not searched and the fact that um, it is not a science-based criteria but is, it is all up to the discretion of a certain person and that has to change in the shortest possible time. And um, additionally, um, we really need to, to understand who are the ones um, preventing us from, from operationalizing the scanners. And to show, in short order, I imagine, we would have them be us and hear what the, their concerns are. Because if the nuclear physicists and the radiation experts are saying there are no health concerns, I can't imagine why um, we would not have this implemented. So um, that is my, my take on um, this exercise, and I, I thank the chairman and um, the rest of the team for um, all that we've achieved, all that we are able to achieve, achieve and I hope that um, it would bring some measure of relief in, in the coming future. Thank you very much, Chairman. May I <coughs> indicate that the strength of any security system is dependent on its weakest link. It is no shock or surprise to have heard what we've suspected for many years, that a large number of firearms on our streets, and not very few, if at all, are manufactured here, the homemade guns, but every single one otherwise is imported into Trinidad and Tobago. And having regard to the numbers that we've seen and we've been told of on the streets, that they really will be coming in on a wholesale basis, not on a retail basis. And if we are to remember the coup of 1990, there was always word that those guns had come in through our ports. It is shocking that after a government had instructed scanners to be put on the port in 2010, Chair, four years after, it took that period of time for, the, for it to be initialized, to hear now that they're not being used, it is more than sabotage our security system. And if there's legitimate reason for it, those legitimate reasons should have been dealt with already and not let our people pay the price with blood 
and the murders that we see on our street with guns. Contraband is contraband, and whether it is drugs, whether it is footwear, whether it is guns, they, they use the same route to come into Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, we need a fix. And I congratulate the chairman and members of this team for taking a very keen interest, not just in identifying problems, but to finding solutions to them. Having highlighted many of the problems, um, it is very clear that we need to use more electronics. The human link in this chain of security is, I think, where our, le uh, uh, our failures come. As we all know, this is no secret anymore and is not to denigrate anyone. But this is a country that has a large part of it being corrupted in almost every institution. And in the ports and wherever you go, there will be persons who will be subject to the almighty dollar and will sell away their duty. And therefore, I, I heed the call from my friend from Point Fortin, the need for more electronics in terms of the surveillance by cameras and for monitoring, not in the port alone, but outside of the port. The NOC was intended as one such node that all for instance, um, feeds from different areas can come into a different area. So the other agencies are looking on, not just leave it to customs as one example, to look after customs business alone. It is all our business. To that end, um, I've been asked by the chairman to make a call for how we're going to fix this. Uh, many do not appreciate that customs fall under the remit of the Ministry of Finance. And therefore, we call on the Minister of Finance and all those technocrats who I'm sure have the best of will to improve our security systems. Um, to call on customs to upgrade their search and their surveillance of potential contraband coming into the country. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. Other countries, as the chairman has indicated, use the scanners profusely. It is the future, and we must use them. But it's not just that. In terms of the other forms of electronic monitoring, tagging, as Senator Richards had mentioned, and other things like that, are easy fixes when one looks at the enormity of the consequence of that failure. So the Ministry of Finance, and we will be making, I'm sure, um, Chair, uh, more detailed recommendations as we proceed to find what is the best practice in the world for our ports here in Trinidad and Tobago. We'll also call on the Ministry of Works to implement, as you know, they are in charge of the actual working of the ports. So we must work in tandem, not separately, but together to protect our citizens. We can fix this problem. But it takes a will, and I want to say that this committee has shown through the leadership of its chairman um, an intent to identify problems. And in a short period that we've actually sat together in terms of the history of this country, we've achieved a whole lot already. And I could only imagine as we proceed knowing that together we can put our minds, our, in, our intelligence together, and that will to make things happen, that we can fix this. So I leave us with some level of hope but with a clear understanding that this is Trinidad and Tobago, and we have to look at those persons whose will is never to help us, but to, to hurt and harm us with the use of the dollar. Thank you. Thank you. I would like at this time to, to reinforce what was already said in, by my colleagues. But first of all, I would like to, to point out that one of the statistics that struck us was the fact that in the last three years, notwithstanding the fact that there is evidence of a number of, of illegal firearms coming into this country, and that in fact this trade is a $100 million trade, there has been no firearms found in the last three years. That in fact is a, a startling statistic. And the committee w was forced in those circumstances to come to three conclusions, three possible conclusions why there has been no firearms found in the port of, port, of, port of Spain. The first, that no firearms do in fact enter these ports. The second, that there is a systemic failure, that is to say an institutional manpower or procedural deficit which has plagued the port of Port of Spain. And the third option is that there are other instances or, or other ports such as suffrages where in fact these firearms do come through. Now my colleagues would have dealt with uh, the options and the possibilities and I think it is fair to say that there is in fact a systemic failure, institutional manpower, procedural deficit at the port of Port of Spain. Uh, in light of this, and not trying to prejudice the outcome of, the, of this report, we were told that 
the security procedure is, it has been developed in accordance with the International Ship and Port Facilities Security Code, and that there are yearly security plans that are implemented and drafted by the Port Police, and that the Coast Guard, on a yearly basis, conducts yearly audits, of which there are a number of recommendations for the improvement of, of security at the Port of Port of Spain. In light of this, um, we would like to call, and we will be investigating further, um, and asking for a review, a comprehensive review of the procedures, plans, and audits to see whether or not uh, these systemic failures that appear to be plaguing the port of, port of Spain can and should have been dealt with in a more speedily fashion. Thank you very much. Members of the media, you have heard from members of this committee the circumstances and the facts as we understand them, and we are now open to any questions you may wish to direct to us. Uh, before the members of the media ask their questions, I'd like to ask that you first introduce yourself and tell us what media house you're from. Thank you. Uh, Jewel Brown from TV6 News. A question to anyone on the committee. Who exactly at the port of Port of Spain uh, raised the issue of health and safety concerns with regard to the scanners? Well, our understanding is that, as I indicated, the matter was first introduced around 2005. It was as long after as 2014 where the physical elements were put in place, commissioned. The workers, including the customs, because the customs are the one who will operate the scanners and maintain the scanners, but of course it is housed in the port of Port of Spain, and the workers of the port are also going to be involved in the whole operations. So we are made to understand that the workers, through their representatives, raise the question of radiation. But the simple facts are that the radiation has been tested and found to be lower than that specified by the World Health Organization and the IAEA the International um, Atomic Energy Authority or agency. And as well, you would have heard here this morning that a radiation expert and a physicist have all cleared the issue of the radiation as a threat. The way this thing is designed, the scanning room is separate and apart from the operation room. There are fixed time frames for the scanning. There are some security protocols to ensure no individual is inside of there while this is being done. And in the MOU that has been signed by some parties, there's an understanding that there would be frequent radiation or air quality checks. And as I said, the radiation in any event has been demonstrated to be less than this, that specified by the World Health Organization and the IEA. So the other unions involved have all in satisfaction to themselves of these issues, they have signed off on the MOU. The only union that has not yet so done is the PSA. And once that is signed off by the PSA, then they can be implemented. Senator Richards will tell you a little more on this. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, our understanding is that there, has been, there have been quite a bit of discussions regarding this issue because, of course, of the complexity and the OSH Act and the health and safety concerns. When you're introducing a system like this, uh, from our uh, tour, and, and our explanations, the explanations given to us last Friday, as the chairman has indicated, there are three unions that are involved, three or four unions, and all uh, but the, the PSC have signed off on the MOU and, and the, the standard operating procedures that have been uh, designed for safe operation and implementation of the uh, container scanner, which, the, which is, I understand, owned by the port, 
through the Ministry of Finance, Shayla, is that correct? But operated by customs. Yeah. And uh, our, our next step in terms of facilitating solutions, because that was, that's what we're about as a committee, is to respectfully call for a meeting with the PSA to see if we can facilitate or, or understand what their concerns may be moving forward to try to, to be the catalyst for solution and implementation of this very important piece of technology uh, in terms of increasing security on the port of Port of Spain. And I of this scanning system will substantially, it will make a substantial contribution to overall border security and the security systems of the port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago and Trinidad and Tobago as a nation, an island state. Uh, the experts who conducted these tests, are they local or foreign persons? I am unable to say, but I know that expertise was applied and they have indicated that they have no issues with the physiological and radiation circumstances. So just for clarification from what I'm getting, Despite the tests that show there are no issue with radiation, as far as you are saying, as far as you've been informed, it is the one union, the PSA, that is holding up this Just process? To, yes, that is our understanding of it. Once they sign off on it, then the workers will be permitted so to do. But, however, there are not... Uh, Persons are not without, because of the nature of this, because of the seriousness of this, because of its impact on security for all of us in Trinidad and Tobago, particularly in light of the, the, the deficiencies that my colleagues have demonstrated here today, there are thoughts about dealing with this matter. In fact, it has been recommended that the operations of this system could, could possibly be outsourced in order to deal with the issue. And that is a recommendation that has come to our attention, and we will now be making recommendations as a committee to the Parliament. So we will look more closely at that, but we cannot continue with a situation where these scanners are implemented in neighboring Barbados, in Jamaica, in all ports of the world. Same modern system. This system is called the MB1215HS relocatable scanner. As I indicated earlier, it penetrates 300 meters of steel. So any false bottoms in containers, false paneling, it will deal with them. It will make the entire container extremely visible. As they search manually now, they are not always able to empty the containers. In fact, in real terms, not only are some containers not at all searched, but those that are searched are not thoroughly searched because man's hands and circumstances could only do so much. So these scanners are very important. Their work for the protection of you, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, is even more important, and it, is, it falls upon us, as Member Ramada indicated. It falls on us, those who have responsibility for leadership in this country, to find a way to make you safe. And if, considering the recommendation that I just mentioned to you is an option, it will be explored. But before that, as Senator Richards indicated, it is the view of this committee that since the PSA is the only agency that has now not yet come on board, so to speak, we will cause them to come before us and we will interrogate their concerns. We hope that with the expertise available to us, we could put those concerns to bed and give the people of Trinidad and Tobago the value for their money that is sitting idly on the port now and the protection that in our view they richly deserve. Yes. Ria Tate Express, do you have a timeline for what you've just said in terms of how far, how long are you prepared to wait to have that system idly sitting there? Well, as Senator Richards and my colleagues, his presence here today indicates we are not about wasting time. The parliament is on recess, but every single person around this table, in particular, Mr. De Freitas, who was in Tobago when he got his call, he made his way here this morning. And we are signaling this committee that we are serious, we are focused, and delays will not be an issue for us. We have already agreed among ourselves, if we have to come out here during the vacation over the next couple of weeks, we will be doing so. 
we will do all that we can with the urgency that this requires because there is an epidemic. The three men who approached Father Harvey recently, every one of them had a firearm. And when they called their friend, he too had one. People in the community is reporting every day, every night. I read a letter this morning from one of my constituents. Gunshots passing in front of window and door. It's down low every minute. She and the son, down low, down low. I have the letter on my desk. So there's a serious problem. Murders are rampant here, and you can't make chicken stew. I'm a vegetarian, but let me put it like this. You can't make chicken stew without chicken. If they don't have all these illegal guns in the place, the 192 crimes where guns were used in the murders, where guns were used, would not happen. It is incumbent on us as a society to act the way this committee is acting, with urgency, with professionalism, with laser beam focus to treat with this problem. We will do our part. Rhea Rambley, CNC3. You, you talk about the implementation of scanners, but what about the CCTV cameras that you say that they are part of the port that desperately need to have those implemented? Ms. Oliveri can comment on this. They had a particular look. One of the things we do on this committee is to sort of um, uh, identify areas that will be focused upon, and uh, Senator Richards and Madam Oliver can comment more specifically on the urgency of the need for these cameras. Mr. Richards. Uh, thank you for your question. Thank you, Chair. When we inquired of the, the port management that gave us the tour, there are some areas that are covered by CCTV cameras, but not to us critical areas or in any modern port facility all areas and, and documentation through that digitized format. Uh, the, the indication from the management was that it was a budget issue. It had been applied for, uh, but it had not been approved. And our chairman had indicated at that point that we would also, as a committee, may make recommendations to the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Works and Transport or the Ministry of National Security to facilitate the expedition of the ordering and installation of those cameras because of the urgency as you would imagine, in a facility like that. So that was my next question. Who, was, who would be responsible for the implementation of the CCTV cameras? And you said the Ministry of Finance is responsible, is the line ministry for the port, so it would be... Customs. For the customs. For customs. Yeah. And the Ministry of Works and Transport for the Port Authority. So if it's a... And national security has... Over. Right. So if Overall. it's a budgetary issue, who would be responsible for allocating? The Port Authority. The Port Authority. But we, as a committee, can make recommendations through the various ministries for application for budget in various capacities and or the implementation of the technology if and when it, it, it's, a, it's a acquired. The other issue is the 40% of containers that's not being scanned. Mm -hmm. How do not you being searched. not being searched? How do you plan to have a hundred percent? Is it a policy change? Well, it's it's by the the facilitation of the the container scanner that can scan one hundred percent of containers passing through the port of Port of Spain. That scanner that container scanner has the capability to scan every single container passing through, in addition to the handheld scanners, of which I believe there are four, which can also augment the work of that scanning uh, operation, making the port a much more efficient on one hand and much safer place to, uh, uh, as, a, as a facility in Port of Spain. And I think it's just um, at this point important to understand that with the standing um, standard operating procedures and the fact that personnel has been trained for use of this fixed scanner, they know that it would take approximately two to five minutes to scan a container and by that you can extrapolate that you can get theoretically to 100% scanning at that location. But it's more importantly um, to be said that you have in conjunction with the fixed scanner the two mobile scanners which can be used at the CARICOM wharf where you would have goods such as sand and, and gravel and other things that may be difficult Lumber. to search through. So if you have the mobile scanners on the port itself, you can use at least one at the CARICOM wharf to increase security there while you um, operationalize the fixed scanner, which by itself can do the 100% of containers. One of the things that was said in the um, tour was that a company managed by the, or owned by the unions controlled the Container yes. yes. Do you see a conflict of interest in this situation, and, and do you think it's a healthy thing? There will always be 
opportunity for conflicts of interest. And therefore, that is why we must be very clear that we do not make any allegation against anyone. However, we must mitigate all of those potential conflicts of interest. And this is really a national security issue rather than a union issue or a port management issue. And therefore, that right supersedes all of those things. And if, therefore, there's a need for a recommendation to be made to mitigate the possibility of a conflict of interest to ensure the security of our people, then I think the committee will boldly do that. Let me make the point equally that we speak to Port of Spain, but it's also the committee's position that every single one of our ports need to be properly manned and scanned. And all legitimate businesses, I would only hope and imagine, will welcome that because the efficiency of the port itself will be dramatically improved having regard to what um, Senators De Freitas and Richards have already indicated. So it is a very healthy thing um, for us to be able to monitor, scan all of our ports. And in that regard, already decided among ourselves that one of our next stops would be the port of Point Lisas and as well um, the airport authority, the airport, um, or airports, because there is possibility of great vulnerability in those areas as well. So the same exercise we are carrying out with the port of Port of Spain, we propose in short order to do this in other ports in Trinidad and Tobago. What about the issue of goods being transported between Trinidad and Tobago and any concern of illegal firearms or drugs being trafficked, trafficked between both islands? Uh, yes, there would be concerns because anybody who has traveled between Trinidad and Tobago either by boat, well especially by boat, would understand that uh, the level of security that happens there is um, not really where it should be. A cursory search of the trunk and then you move forward. And this is what I was saying before, when you look at the total value of the trade as reported, $100 million, and then you look at where the security level is at and the port in Trinidad, given that Trinidad is the first point where these containers would be searched, then it has a run-on effect for Tobago. So there would be concern in regard as to traveling between Trinidad and Tobago on the vessels, as well as once we beef up security on the ports, then that will also have that run-on effect on Tobago, where you would see the security for Tobago, especially containers coming in, with the endpoint being in Tobago, being better handled. That's why that 100% search is, is very, very important. The third you had raised uh, the SSA data, and you were saying that based on that, the majority of guns illegally coming into Trinidad and Tobago are not from illegal points of entry, but from the legal ports. Outside of the issue of the container, the, the scanning of containers, is the committee, you or anyone else could answer, looking at what other measures can be done to improve that uh, security system while you are working on the issue of the implementation of the scanners? Well, I, I don't know if um, you cover proceedings in the courts, but most of the proceedings in courts dealing with seizures at sea, cocaine for instance, you realize most of them, um, there are no firearms found. So, and if you balance that with what the SSA has found and, and the um, proliferation of, of guns in this country, you would see, and criminal practice would tell you, that it is not... Um, in the best interest of those trafficking drugs to have guns with them on high seas. Um, that makes for a, a, a disaster, so to speak. But um, having identified what we see as a um, major deficiency in terms of the ports, the legal ports where guns are coming in, and, and we know from cases in the courts that um, hundreds of firearms came through, we know now that um, 1990, for instance, I'm sure Mr. Ramada would bear that out, that the, the guns that came in came through the port. Um, the finding Valsin that is before the courts of this country came through the ports, and there was another find in Point Lisas, again, that's through the ports. And these are high-powered firearms and not small arms. Generally, um, the arms, if they do come into this country by pure by pure and through the drug trade would be small arms and um, experience in court has shown that. But what we intend to do um, in the short term is to deal with the big ticket items to see if we can put a serious dent into the gun trade as it relates to the ports. Um, we, there are other areas with respect to small craft owners uh, along the um, west coast, those who own small craft, the 1% the, the and so on, and, and the yachties and so on. We do intend to look at procedures with respect to, to those persons to see if we can make a dent there. Um, 
we know um, sociology and, and criminology would tell you that you cannot eradicate crime. Um, you cannot get rid of it 100%. But um, we hope through the work of this committee to make recommendations so that we can at least make a substantial dent in um, the firearms trade. And once we make a substantial dent in the firearms trade, um, we believe that we can also make a substantial um, dent in the murder rates. And, and you know, most of the murders in this country are committed using firearms. So, so that's the focus at this point, the big ticket items. And we intend to move to other areas where we can, um, where we believe um, our input is needed. If I might just add, there are a number of other what they call surrogate ports, about 14 of them. So these are matters that will attract the attention of the committee as well, as well as a Senator Coppin identified the general ISO, um, the standard for all the ports. So there's a lot of work to be done. And having said that, Having said that, it is a fact, and I don't think we could be contradicted on this one, that not sufficient work is being done by those who are paid to do work in Trinidad and Tobago, from the labor in the regional corporation, right on up through this country. A large, in fact, when we got this whole team together before this committee, two things they admitted, every single one of the entities in front of us, two things, and they, ex they express editorial boy it out. One, lethargy, what I call low energy, inefficiency, failure to work for the day's pay, laziness and sloth and worthlessness. And two, the possible, and that is WT, eh? <laughs> and the possibility as well of corruption, as Senator Ram Ramada, as MP Ramada pointed out a while ago, and complicity. I have always held the view that a lot that happens in a country could never happen unless there was some complicity on the part of state elements. That's my own view. And um, so in so far as the work is concerned, there's a lot of work to be done. And the people of Trinidad and Tobago, like this committee, recognize there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of wishful thinking, but at the end of the day, it is work. It is thought, it is work, it is professionalism, it is implementation that will tighten the platform to make this place safer for us all. So I take the opportunity to call on all of us wherever we are, in the media, in the corporation, in the police service, in the nursing service, to get to work. It is one of the ways, too, that we could, like China, grow the national economy by being more productive, all of us, and stop lagging lazily behind. We have room for one more question. Kyle Saunders on my 95. Senator Richards. What specific recommendations have been made to deal with the CARICOM jetty? As we know, we have the free movement of people. With regards to the CARICOM jetty, what sort of recommendations have been made to deal with the CARICOM with well, the jetty? To be honest, we just had our tour on Friday. So the uh, very erstwhile and capable parliament staff will compile an official document to be signed off by the chairman and the rest of the committee where we will meet. It will go to Parliament, we will make official recommendations, it will be a presumptuous of me to make recommendations at this point, but that will be as, as the uh, Chairman indicated with great dispatch, given the gravity of the situation, but certainly as we indicated, the, the employment of technology, uh, the, uh, the, the low hanging fruit, uh, less access for personnel in and out of that area and other areas in the port uh, are the obvious areas and tightening up of systems to bolster security. All right, we'll take one last question from Ria. The members talked about the human element on the port. And one of the things, having gone on the tour, um, and, and I ask, I say this to find out how important is 100% scanning. One of the things that struck me was that the, there were arbitrary criteria for selection. I, I recall on one occasion um, the, one of the individuals saying that certain products were not searched. And you asked for an example, and the person said tiles, and you said you thought it was tiles, and he said, well, that too. And it struck me that, you know, you could decide that tiles, tires, uh, a certain list of products 
would not have firearms or would not have anything illegal and not to search that as opposed to other products. What scientific basis, you know? There, there, there was virtually very little, and this is the point that Senator Richards has been making ever since. I mean, there, there seems to be a lot of human discretion in here. One of the examples they gave us as well is parts, like if people on the bamboo hire parts, they don't mm -hmm. search those. Yeah. It's too cumbersome, it's too problematic. They may have had a course of dealings with the person, so that person is scoring high on their credibility right. list. It's far too dis discretionary and unscientific. I don't think there's any port. I'm, I'm chancing this. I don't know if they, they, in terms of the ease of doing business and efficiency, I don't know if you really will find any port where all containers are searched. But certainly, as Senator DeFreitas has pointed out, given the numbers that we pass through here, the throughput, as they call it, with those scanners at three minutes per scan, we have the capacity to search all or close to all, mm -hmm. if we chose so to do. So I thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the members of this committee. We thank you for coming, and we hope that we have done two things, bring clarity to some very uh, searching issues that troubles every one of us in Trinidad and Tobago, and more specifically, we hope that we would have advanced our work as a society in terms of protecting the people of Trinidad and Tobago, which is essentially what we are all about. Thank you very kindly, and um, God bless. With that, we have come to the end of this media briefing. We'd also like to say thank you to our listeners and viewers on Parliament Channel 11 and Parliament Radio 105.5 FM. Also on our YouTube channel, Paul View. we wish you all a good afternoon as we return to our regular scheduled programming. Parliament Channel and Parliament Radio 105.5 FM.